Welcome to Basic Introduction to Deep Learning. This course is going to be broken up into three parts. The first part is going to be about linear models and looking at key components of machine learning in the context of linear models. And this is going to give us some intuition about concepts that will then be used in part two to talk about neural networks. And then once we have an idea of how neural networks work, then we will look at a particular type of neural network in part three called convolutional neural networks. To start off, as I said, what we're going to be talking about in part one are the key components of machine learning, particularly in the context of linear models. The first component and really one of the biggest components of machine learning is your data. Now, often what we can view data as is it's a set of inputs and true outputs that correspond to those inputs. And those inputs and outputs can be very different depending on the data and the sort of problem you're trying to solve given your data. Once you have your data and sort of the problem you're wanting to solve by having an input and true outputs, then the question is, well, how, given an input, do you transform that input into an output that hopefully will be close to the true output for that input? Now, these models are generally characterized by things called parameters. And so different settings of the parameters will lead to different transformations from inputs to outputs. Now, we talked about wanting to find a model, i.e. the parameters of the model, that lead to a transformation that gives us good outputs from the model, given that we know what the true outputs should be for an input. Well, how do we define what good is in this context? So to do that, what we define is we define something called an objective function. And this is a mathematical formula for determining whether an output from our model for a particular input is good, given that we know what the true output was for that input. Then once we have this objective function, we have an, a way to figure out how a prediction from our model is good, then what we ha have to do is we want to know how can we find the model parameters, i.e. the transformation defined by our model, that leads to good model outputs. And the way to find these parameters is called the learning algorithm. And so we're going to go through these key components of machine learning by looking at a couple linear models. So first off, we're going to be looking at the data. So, well, one very common type of data would be some sort of data that's used for regression problems. In this case, we have one of the most simple cases of this, where you have an input that's one dimensional, that's just one real value, x, and you have another uh, value, y, which is the output, which is also a real value number. And so the goal is, given x, what should y be? What real valued number should y be? Another very common type of data is classification data. One of the simplest ways you can look at this is that you can have an input that has two dimensions, i.e. two values, in this case, x1 and x2, which in this context are both real valued numbers. And each x1, x2 pair is associated with a certain class, in this case, either blue or red. And blue is given a label of zero, and red is given a label of one. And so the goal in this sort of problem with this sort of data is saying, given an x1, x2 pair, so a point, should that point be blue, i.e. given a label of zero, or red, i.e. given a label of one. So now that we have sort of 
an idea of what sort of data we might have and sort of the problems associated with this type of, with this type of data. Now we want to define a model that will allow us to transform our input to an output. In the case of regression, one of the simplest models is something called linear regression, where you just fit a line that takes X as input, multiplies that by a weight, and then adds a bias B. And then that gives us a predicted Y or a predicted output for that X for this model. For, logis for classification, in this simple case, the model that is often used is called logistic regression. And in logistic regression, the goal is to find a line that separates the two classes. So here would be an example. And logistic regression works by having a linear part of logistic regression model where you have a weight for each of the input dimensions. In this case, a weight for x1, a weight for x2, plus a bias. Then that linear part of the model, once you compute the value that comes out of that, is called the logit, that value that you computed. Then that logit is put through a sigmoid, which is defined uh, on the slides. And what that does is that pushes the value of the logit, the sigmoid, pushes the value of the logit to be between zero and one. And this is often interpreted as the probability that y equals one. So in this case, if you had a value that was greater than 0.5, then you'd say for this input, the model thinks that the predicted label is more likely to be one, i.e. red, than zero, i.e. blue. If it's below 0.5, the probability of outputted after applying the sigmoid to the logit, then you would say it's more likely that the point, the input data point, is blue, i.e. has a label of zero. So once we have sort of our models, we can say, okay, well, we're getting these predictions from the model, either a real value prediction in the case of linear regression or a probability of y, y equaling one from the logistic regression model. So, but how do we know if these predictions are good? So to do that, we define objective functions. In the case of linear regression, what we have is when we have an input, our model will give us a predicted output. However, that predicted output may not be, and usually is not, exactly equal to the true output associated with input xi. The difference between the true output and our predicted output from our model is called the residual, which here is noted by R. And so what we really want to do is we want these differences to be as small as possible. And so what happens is we try and formulate a particular type of objective function called a loss. And a loss is something that we want to make as small as possible. Or i.e. we want to minimize that particular objective function. So what we do is we can formulate a loss, which, as a reminder, just means that we it's an objective function that we want to minimize. Then, in this case, what we're saying is we want to minimize or make the residuals as small as possible. So what we do is we square each residual and then add them all together across all of the different data points that we have in our training set. So this says that a model is good if the squared residuals for each of our data points are small. That is, the predictions are close to the true output values. For classification, it's different. So we have this line for logistic regression. And what the sigmoid is doing is it is pushing logits, 
that are high to be close to one and logics that are very low to be close to zero. What this means is that a good model is one that has, in this case, the blue data points as far on one side as possible and the red data points as far on the other side as possible. That means that the blue data points would be getting values as close to zero as possible, whereas the red data points would be getting values that are close to one as possible. And so this sort of concept is built into a loss called the cross entropy uh, error. And so what we want to do is we want to win a point is red, we want the probability to be as close to one as possible for y equaling one. And when a point is blue, we want the probability of y equaling, or basically the output being zero to be as high as possible. And so that's what the cross entropy is doing. The negative sign just means that high probabilities will become low numbers. So then that allows us to say that getting things that have high probabilities by being far away, when we minimize, we want that high probabilities to be correspond to low values. And so that's what the negative sign in front of the summations and the loss uh, does. So now that we have this objective function concept, we can say, how now do we find the parameters? So in the case of these models, our, our weights and our biases that lead to models that do well. And so what we're going to go over here is the most common learning algorithm used in deep learning. Um, it is also applicable to linear models. So we're going to look at it in the context of linear models uh, before we go into more complicated uh, neural network models. The most common learning algorithm is called gradient descent. And in gradient descent, what you want to do is you want to say, OK, we have a current setting of our parameters. How do we need to change those so that we minimize or make our loss as small as possible? And to do that, you calculate something called the gradient, which says, how does changing our parameter change our loss? Because if we know how changing our parameter changes our loss, we will know how to change our parameter because we want to make our loss smaller. To sort of get a visual visualization for this, we're going to look at a simple case where we have one weight and then our loss is a parabola. Well, what happens if we have a starting weight? What we want is we want to find a weight that corresponds to a loss that is as small as possible. So what you can do is you can say, okay, for this weight, how does changing that weight change our loss? And we know that we want to go in the direction that will reduce the loss. So that's what this negative sign is saying, is that we want to go in the direction that if we change the parameter in that direction, will decrease the loss. The alpha is how far in that direction do we want to go and is called the learning rate. Once we have changed our parameter based off the learning rate and how much we think we need to change the parameter to change the loss, then we will get a new parameter setting. And in gradient descent, you just do this over and over or iteratively until you get a weight where changing your parameter does not really change your loss. And that will happen at a the minimum of the function. It, it may only be a local minimum and not a global minimum. Uh, we won't go over those details here, but for those that are interested, uh, yeah, it'll just find a 
local minimum instead of a global uh, minimum. So, well, how exactly would you do gradient descent with the linear model? So what you can do in a lot of machine learning models is use something called the chain rule. So the chain rule says, how do you calculate changes given that you have a chain of functions? So in the case of linear model, our chain of functions is our linear predicted prediction model, and then the loss, which would just be the square of the difference between the output of our linear model and the true output. And so what we can do is this chain rule says that if we know how changing our prediction changes our loss, we can just multiply that by how changing our parameter changes our prediction. And that will tell us how changing our parameter changes our loss. One of the nice things about linear models is that how changing our parameter changes our prediction is quite easy to get. And it is just the input that corresponds to that parameter. You can do something similar for logistic regression, except that now you have the linear part of logistic regression. You apply a sigmoid, and then you apply the loss to the output of that sigmoid. So we are going to use the chain rule three times because we have a chain of three functions. And so we can say, okay, how does changing our sigmoid prediction change our loss? How does changing our logit, i.e. the output of the linear part of the logistic regression model, change our sigmoid? And then how does changing our parameter change our logit? As with linear regression, um, the linear part of this model allows us to easily figure out what change, how changing our parameter will change our logit. And it's just going to be the input dimension value associated with that parameter that we're looking at. In gradient descent, uh, one of the very common modifications made uh, is something called momentum. And in momentum, instead of changing a parameter just based off the gradient or the local calculation of how changing a parameter changes your loss or changes your objective function, you accumulate the various gradients over all the various iterations that you've seen before. And you accumulate them using some weighting factor, beta, often called the, the momentum value. And then based off of that, you can then update the parameter based off that accumulated gradient. Now, what this allows the method to do is if a the current gradient agrees with past gradients, then that means the model will make larger changes, or excuse me, the learning algorithm will make larger changes to the parameters of the model. However, if they disagree, then the gradients may cancel out and the changes could be quite uh, small. And so this often allows the basically gradient descent method to have better performance uh, than if you did not use uh, momentum. So to sort of wrap up what we looked like, what we looked at in part one of this course is the data or basically how do we sort of look at uh, um, the inputs and true outputs that we have. And then we can say, okay, what sort of problem are we trying to solve? Then based off of the answers to those questions, we can figure out what type of model or what sort of transformation do we want to do to our inputs to get uh, predictions for our, our true outputs. Then for that model, we can define what is an objective function. And then we can use that objective function to define what is a good model. And in the case of linear regression, we, we saw how uh, one a particular type of objective function was the 
some of the squared residuals and that we wanted to minimize that. I use it as a loss. For logistic regression, we saw how we wanted to use cross entropy to make it so that the probability of the logistic regression predicting the right label was um, maximized. Then we said, okay, given these defini definitions of data, model, and objective function, how do we find good model parameters? And then we looked at how gradient descent can be used to do that. In the next part, we're going to look at how we can use these concepts and intuitions that we built up in linear models uh, when looking at neural networks.